Hello, Pastor Tracy here. I'm the assistant pastor here at Calvary Chapel Eastside, and we just want to thank you for streaming this uh, teaching today. We hope that it encourages you, that it builds you up, but most importantly, that it challenges you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, we just want to say that we offer these teachings online as an additional resource, in addition to your personal Bible study time and your time at a local church. See, we believe that being a part of a local church is key to your growth, and we believe that it is mandated in God's Word for us to be a part of a local body. So please, be involved in a local body, support a local church. That's very important. Now, if you are not a part of a local church, we would love to invite you to come and be a part of what goes on here at Calvary Chapel Eastside. You can look on our website at cceschurch.com. It'll give you all of the information that you need to know, our background, our service times, and where our location is at. We would love to have you come and join with us, but until then, God bless you, and may God bless you richly. We're in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, if you'd like to turn there, a book we haven't visited uh, until we hit it last Sunday, we hadn't seen this book in 16 years. So it's uh, certainly, certainly time. Uh, Nehemiah is a book that chronicles the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls about, let's use round numbers, about 400 years before Jesus was born. You'll remember as the people were overrun in Israel by the Babylonian uh, forces after three successive waves of invasion, they were taken into captivity and spent the next 70 years there and then trickled back over the subsequent 100 plus years as different groups at different times made their way back. Some never did come back. Reminds me of COVID. Half the church left at COVID and half of them never came back. Uh, and I think that Satan has, is onto a strategy. You keep them out of church long enough, it becomes their habit to stay out of church. Uh, so Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find faith? Will he find people still going to church, believing in his word and, and praying? Will he, will he find that? Uh, I think that he'll find it in the remnant. But that is what we are today. Make no mistake about it, we are a remnant. If you haven't noticed it, Christians are not at the top of the popularity list of most pagans. Um, so uh, as we become increasingly a remnant, I, I, I am reminded of how much we have in common with the people that came back under Ezra and Zerubbabel before him and Nehemiah after him. Uh, God has always dealt with a remnant. He's do always dealt, he's accomplished his purposes with people just like you and I, common people, prophets and teachers and pastors and Levites and fishermen and tax collectors, and the list goes on and on. I think it's our privilege to be used by the living God, to be loved by Him. I mean, I had you tell each other, God, Jesus loves you before we sat down and, and had, a, had our Bible study time here. Uh, have you ever asked yourself the question, why? It's not because we're particularly lovable. We have our... Issues? Can we call them that? Leave it there? Uh, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. But he loves us anyway. That humbles me. Because I know I don't deserve it. I know I didn't deserve it. I couldn't buy it if I had a bazillion dollars. God is love. And I, I just, uh, because of that simple fact alone, I... I just fall more and more in love with him with every passing day because I see he works through people like Nehemiah. Now, the end of chapter 1 had told us he was a cup bearer to the king. Sounds like a table waiter, a dishwasher, or somebody up, up there. No, no. Back then in the Persian court, everybody was trying to poison everybody at some point in time. There was a lot of court intrigues in the imperial court of the Medo-Persian Empire. And so they took to having somebody very trusted and close to them sample all of their food and drink before the king partook. And so it was a, it was a, a political uh, office that he held that was of one of very high respect. He had the king's ear. He had the king's confidence, trust. He was loyal to the king above all else, and the king knew that in his heart of hearts, or the guy didn't get the job. But it was also a position that caused other people to try to lean on Nehemiah so he could lean on the king and get favors done. So it was a, a court position that could be open to graft and political corruption, 
Of course, we don't have any of that today in our government circles nationwide, but back then they did. You know, we'd, we're not poisoning our, our kings and stuff like that, but there is still uh, no end to the evil of iniquity that we see in some political circumstances sometimes. Uh, and that's when, instead of getting discouraged or mad if you've been tempted to throw shoes at the TV in the last couple of uh, election cycles, just remind yourself all over again, look up, for your salvation draws nigh. That's our ultimate hope, isn't it? Jesus Christ. Well, Nehemiah, his name means the Lord comforts. There's a man whose name is, describes his mission in a nutshell. The Lord comforts. What I typically find is he comforts those best that draw nearest to him. Didn't Jeremiah tell us, even before the captivity, the Lord had spoken to his servant Jeremiah and said, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for good, not for evil. Plans to prosper you and to bring you to an expected end. Now God said, I know the plans that I have for you. He didn't say that you and I know the plans. That's discovered one day at a time as we walk by faith, and that's what this whole journey is about. We're, we don't walk by sight because he shows us what the, his next 20-year plan for us is. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. But then he said something through Jeremiah. He said, you will seek me, and you will find me when you Seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So God has done his part. He has sent his son. He's purchased our redemption. He's written the book. He's given us his Holy Spirit. Our part is to do the seeking, asking, and knocking. Don't take it for granted or you'll miss God completely. God said, you do the seeking. I'll do the answering. And so in this book, 10 times, Nehemiah drops to his knees and prays, seeking the face of 10 times. It is the most notable thing that stands out in the whole book. He, be, he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Whoopee, that's fine. That's great. They, they needed their walls rebuilt. But what I find is that this man enjoyed the favor of God because he was seeking the face of God. In my quiet time this morning, I was reading in Exodus uh, chapter 34, I just have to share this with you, and, and I, I know that you know this passage well, but in, in Exodus 34, I can never get enough of that passage because it is where God calls Moses to the top of the mountain. You remember Moses had come down after being with the Lord on the top, top of Mount Sinai, receiving the law. He'd been up there for 40 days and 40 nights, came back. The people gave him up for lost and and pressured poor Aaron into making a golden calf. They started getting party and, and, and getting drunk and stuff like that, very inappropriate stuff. Moses comes down from the mountain, and if you've never watched uh, the Ten Commandments with the old uh, uh, Charlton Heston, oh, that's the, he comes down, those that will not live by the law shall die by the law, and he chucks the tablets down, and I'll bet as soon as he did, he goes, oh, oh my, what did I just do? What did I just do? And they broke into a chameleon pieces, you know, uh, he took the idol, ground it to powder, threw it in the water, and made the people drink it. Gross, from front to back. Well, anyway, God says, tell you what, Moses, why don't you come back up the mountain? I'll make you two more tablets of stone, just like the first one. Now, it says in chapter 33 that they were inscribed front and back. In other words, this wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was written in a teeny little script and probably had the bulk of the Mosaic law written on. There's a lot of repetition in the first five books as it pertains to the Levites. In one instance, the second generation in the book of Deuteronomy, things like that. But I can just see the fine writing on the pages written in, in proto-Hebrew language, written by, inscribed by the finger of God on both sides. And God had enabled this 80-year-old man to climb to the top of a 16,000-foot mountain with two stone tablets under each arm. <laughs> mm. Up there, he met with God. He had asked God in chapter 33, Lord, I would love to see you. I hear your voice. I see you in the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar uh, of fire by night, uh, following us, leading us, guiding us through the desert. But Lord, I'd, I'd give anything to see you face to face. You ever felt that in your heart of hearts? You read the book, you know the Lord and Savior, and there's just a part of you that hungers, that longs for a more intimate, personal presence with him. I just, 
And I think that, that someday I know that will be fulfilled. But there's that, there's that ache, that hunger that says, oh, I would love to walk the shores of the Galilee with you. I would have loved to have been there at the resurrection with the disciples. More than that, Lord, I hope that I'm alive when you're coming in the clouds for your church and calling us homeward. But someday we will see him face to face. But uh, and I know that the Bible tells us that no man can see God in all of his glory, all of his holiness and live. Uh, but, but Moses gets the next best thing. So in chapter 34 of Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I'll write on them the words that were on the first two tablets which you broke. There's not a hint of rebuke for Moses' break in the first set because there is such a thing as holy indignation. You see it in Jesus when he drives out the money changers in the temple. There is a time and place for just... You know, you, especially when you know what is right and you see wrong being thrust at you. There's just that sense of, of moral indignation. And, there, and so God says, I understand completely why you did what you did, Moses. So I'll make you a second set. Verse 2, so early in the morning, uh, be ready in the morning, and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me on top of the mountain. No one there may come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in the front of the mountain. Because God is holy. Boy, we take that for granted. We couldn't come into his presence if it weren't for the holiness of Jesus. Amen. We'd be incinerated uh, in a second. So Moses chiseled out the two stone tablets like the first ones, went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord commanded. I love his prompt obedience. He didn't blink twice. You want me up there? I'm up there, Lord. Another hike up that 16,000-foot mountain, and I'm 80 years of age, and I got arthritis and a thousand excuses why a younger guy should be doing this instead of me. And God equips him, and as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried a, the two stone, two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood with him there. Because God is not a man but is a spirit, he takes upon the form of a man and stands there. That's anthropomorphic language. Stands there with Moses. I believe with all of my heart it was Jesus Christ. He is the glory of God. He is the manifestation of God. In him dwells the fullness of divinity and deity. Then the Lord came down. And notice the Lord there in verse 5 is all in capital letters. He came down. Yahweh came down. The covenant name of the Old Testament name of God came down in the cloud, stood there with him, and proclaimed his name. Yahweh. Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses, whom he had hidden in a cleft of the rock, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. Describes him, does it describe you? Mm. Yet, if it's not Monday, I, there's a fair shot at it. But, <laughs> you know, if the dog, if our little puppy Wee Wee's on the carpet, mm, all bets are off. But the Lord describes himself as compassionate and gracious as he has been to you and I. Grace means he has not treated us according to our sins, but according to his love, his mercy. It's God's riches at Christ's expense is how I've heard this grace described by Billy Graham eons back. God is slow to anger, and if God sits on the throne of our heart, we should be just like him, Amen. like father, like son. We are the sons of God, we've been adopted into his own family. Jesus Christ is the son of God. There's no confusion there. I'm not equating any of us with Jesus Christ, although Jesus did tell his disciples one time, he said, you call me Lord, and that's right, because I am. But from now on, I call you my friends. Because we've been adopted into his own family. And again, that should humble you because you know what you deserve. You and I know what we deserve, and yet he has treated us. According to his love and grace and mercy, he is slow to anger, bounding in love and faithfulness. Faithfulness, which me means he's full of faith. He will keep his promises. Amen. Keeps his promise. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. All of our sins have been judged put on the Lord Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed to remove our sins from us. 
the righteous standard of God. Understand, God's standard is perfection. He didn't relax his standards to let you and I into the kingdom of heaven. He paid the price. His son, his blood shed so that you and I might be pronounced holy in his sight. Our sins have been punished. You see, God didn't relax his standards. He wouldn't be a good judge if he said, oh, let the criminals go. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. All of our sins have been punished. And then Moses simply cries out to him, Lord, I want you to lead us and guide us on this journey, this life's journey ahead of us. Would you lead us and guide us, please? And it's a plea. It's a child's plea that Moses offers up. It's not a demand. It's not a command. It is one humble thing that he asks of him, that you, you would go with us, Lord. You've done things that no one has ever seen done before on behalf of your people. And then the Lord said, that's okay, I'll lead you, I'll guide you, my presence will go with you when you come into the land. Don't act like them, don't do like them, don't worship their false gods, don't tolerate that nonsense. In fact, when you come into the land, here's a religious toleration for you from a biblical perspective, burn and smash their altars, tear down their holy places, and burn their Asherah poles. That's God's view of religious toleration because there is one truth or one way, one life. It is Jesus Christ, and all others are lies. Why would we tolerate the presence of, of lies and false religions? In the millennial kingdom, can I tell you, there aren't going to be any mosques. Okay, there's no, 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 going to be no temples to Buddha. There's none of that nonsense in there. Can I tell you, Jesus is going to be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, King of kings and Lord of lords, and there will be no other tolerated. Uh, and I think while we live in a day and age today where we are called religious zealots and extremists because of our views, according to God, it's what marks us as his children. We pray for those that are in bondage to false gods. Let's kick back on over back to Nehemiah chapter 2 as we pick up our text there. Nehemiah is a man of prayer. He seeks God. God responds to Moses was a man who sought God, and God said, won't you come up to the top of the mountain and meet with me face to face? I encourage you to build your altars. Abraham, what separated him from his son Isaac was that Abraham was an altar builder. Isaac dug wells. Needed in a desert, I'm giving you that. Got to water the sheep. Yeah, man doesn't live long in a desert without water. But one seems to be a little more self-serving than the other, doesn't it? I encourage you every day, build your altars, whether it's in your quiet place or on, on the couch with your Bible open, the dining room table with a cup of coffee. But you should set aside a little bit of time every single day to become an altar builder and seek God. Otherwise, you won't find him. You will seek me and you will find me, the Lord said, when you... You, 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 you seek me with all of your heart. If you and I don't do that, you won't meet him. You won't see him. You go, well, how come I don't sense the presence of God like you do, Pastor Jim? Pastor Dwayne, how come I don't feel God's presence like you do? Are you seeking? Are you reading? Are you praying? Are you building your altars every day and say, Lord, I'm offering myself once again a living sacrifice, like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says to do. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, how often did the Jews offer sacrifice? They did it daily, every day. You and I should do the same. Amen. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. We understand the offering for sin has been offered and accepted. What you and I are is the burnt offering. That's a voluntary sacrifice that's offered up by the guy who wants to seek God more than the average parishioner. It was a voluntary offering. No, you don't know. You, you, can, you can make it to heaven and not read your Bible. Don't know why you'd want to not read your Bible if you're a child of God. It's the only book he ever wrote. You want to read another book? Why? You got time for that and not this? Ah, we have a difficult time justifying that. We seek. Didn't Jesus say if we ask and seek and knock, we'll find the door will be opened. It'll be given to us. That, but it, our part is, is the seeking. It says in verse 1 of chapter 2, what, a, what an introduction, huh? <clears throat> Sorry. 
in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine, after obviously tasting it, and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Well, let's stop right there. We have some three to four months between uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, where he has been seeking the face of God once he has heard what a total mess the ruined city, the bombed out city of Jerusalem was. Its gates had been broken down. They'd rebuilt the temple, but the city was still totally defenseless. And he has been praying about that now for three to four months. Man, talk about persevering in prayer. This man puts me to shame. I, I, I wonder when's the last time you or I prayed about something for three to four months. Seeking God with fasting and with prayer, like Ezra in the, in the book before this one, throwing himself down on his face before the Lord, weeping, tearing his garments, pulling out his beard and his hair by the handfuls because he was so grieved about the spiritual condition of, of the people that had come back into the land. Why the four-month delay? Maybe he just needed more time for prayer. Maybe he was just waiting for the right moment to approach the king. Or maybe it wasn't God's time yet. I like the whole idea of prayer not being answered immediately because it forces us to do a couple of things. Wait. Keep on praying. Those are good things. Those are good. A lot more benefits to prayer that we'll talk about here in, in just a minute. But have you ever been in that situation where, man, I've been praying about something for days after day, week after week. I've been asking for a healing for month after month. You, you poor guys have been through it all. You know, and I look at everybody in here over the age of 50, and we go, well, yeah, we could write books on the uh, list of junk we got going on in our lives. You know, And you pray about these things. And sometimes it seems like nothing changes right away. I've been praying for Jesus Christ to come back for half a century, for 50 years. I've been praying. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop praying. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. It's one of the hardest things we have to do as Christians because it doesn't come naturally. I mean, we like McDonald's because it gives our burger right now. And if they don't, we're at the drive-up window honking our horn and going, we're the burger, we're the burger, come on, need a burger. If we have to make, wait more than two or three minutes, don't, don't think that God is, is some drive-up window at McDonald's. And that's where prayer is doled out. He wants you to labor in prayer. He wants you to persevere in prayer, not give up in prayer. Just because we haven't seen the answer yet doesn't mean we won't see the answer, but it's up to you and I. What's he doing? He's in part testing our faith. Do we believe that he hears, that he answers? Yes. With all of my heart, I believe that. But he may answer in a way I did not anticipate. Why do you pray? Because you want God to do something for you. You already have in your mind what you want him to do. You've asked him to do that, and you've told him what it is you want him to do. We sometimes get the mistaken notion he's a genie in a bottle and all we got to do is rub Aladdin's lamp and the cloud comes forth and we get three wishes. Always make your third wish three more wishes. <laughs> do that. I'm not afraid of you walking in any genie. You had a point there, Therese? I'm sorry. I, I can't, I, praise in prayer. As you wait upon the Lord, praise him. Thank him. I mean, every day fresh, there's something new to be praising him about. When you wake up in the morning, while you may not feel like getting out of bed, praise him that you were awake enough to think about getting out of bed. I mean, you could be looking at the underside of the dirt. You know, there's a lot of options God has spared us from. Sometimes God says yes to your requests, and that's what we like to hear. And we praise him for that. When he says wait, we get a scowl on our face. We're willing to accept it, but we don't like it. What we really don't like is when he says no. He does say no. He does say no. 
I think the safest way to pray is just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He outlined everything that was on his heart and then said, but not my will be done, but thine. I think that's a good way to end your prayers because I, don't, I don't always know what's best for me. I think I do. Lord, I wouldn't mind winning the lottery. You know, I'm just saying, you know, I, you got to play the lottery to win. I know that, but maybe somebody could throw a ticket in the a tithe box. Or something. You never know. Uh, do I have a realistic expectation that's going to happen? No, probably couldn't handle it if, I, if we did. For, have you ever thought about what you do if you ever won the lottery? Well, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I pay the taxes, I've thought about that. First thing I do is I pay off everybody's mortgage. I pay off everybody. I buy everybody a new car. I pay off the building. Yeah, maybe we'd all go on a cruise somewhere for two weeks. I don't know. You know, but I, I have no use for those, that kind of money at all. Let God be God. When you pray, you better make sure that your will is submitted to his because he just may say no or wait. Maybe he will say yes, but let God be God. He knows what's best for you. He knows what he's doing. Yes. Dennis is alluding to the prosperity teaching that says it's God's will that all of us be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. Then why aren't any of us? Seems to fly in the face of reality for the most of us. Seems like the only people getting rich are the guys preaching that gospel, which is no gospel, as Paul said. Ah, that's right. Or maybe you had faith, but they'll blame it on somebody else. I've met a lot of people that had prayed for a healing. When it didn't happen, they cursed God and turned their heel on them. That's what's wrong with that theology. It's not just a damnable theology. Not only is it biblically wrong, but it sets people up for failure. I've got personal friends, my very close personal friends of me and Kathy's. Um, her sister had gotten sick, and they claimed a healing, and she died. All of them went through a crisis of faith when that happened. And instantly the church started blaming them. Well, it must have been your guys' fault that she died. Now, wait a minute. Stop right there. How many people have died since Adam? Everybody. So where's the faith, lack of faith there? That's nonsense. Everybody dies. And I haven't seen a well person die yet. They die sick. That's why they die. <laughs> they didn't get past it. Nobody dies and goes, okay, I think I'll die. No. <laughs> and you're gone. That's not the way that works. So it's, it's an insane argument that flies in the face of reality. Uh, how about Epaphroditus who almost died for the sake of the gospel and Paul couldn't heal him? How about Paul who had a, a thorn in the flesh, perhaps an, an eye disease? He couldn't even heal himself. He could heal everybody else. Three times he asked God to heal him, and in a nutshell, 2 Corinthians, uh, God said no. My strength is perfected in weakness, which is a very polite way of saying no. And he didn't get healed. You know, how about Epaphras, who, who the church at Thessalonica had heard was sick, and he almost perished. What, you, all of these guys got no faith? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think that we tend to be self-serving. We still have sinful, fallen flesh, but I think let God be God. I have... Early on in my ministry, Dennis, I'd go to the hospital and I'd pray for people, and about six of them in a row died. They started calling me Dr. Doom. Yeah, have Pastor Jim pray over you. You'll be dead in no time, you know? And I thought, you know, really, I believe in prayer. I believe in healing with all of my heart. I've seen healing. I've experienced healing. But God doesn't always heal. Why? Don't know. I don't know. He's God and I'm not. He hasn't tipped his hat to me. Oh, well, Pastor Jim, here, let me explain this to you because I owe you an explanation. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Let God be God. I pray for healings, believe in healings, want to see healings. I've seen many in the past. We'll see many in the future, but not all are healed. 
good friend of mine, Lendl Cooley, who headed up the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida a number of years ago, was their praise and worship leader. Uh, here, uh, five weeks ago, he had a dissecting aortic aneurysm, which takes the top of the aorta and the l- different layers inside that major blood vessel that's big around started tearing apart, and it tore all the way down uh, to where it bifurcates into the uh, the greater uh, femoral arteries there. And it's, w- it's, it's the single most excruciating pain a man can feel. Uh, if you don't see a doctor within 30 minutes and the proper diagnosis is made, most of those people die. Well, Linda Cooley uh, was on uh, TV Sunday uh, sitting on a bench t- telling his people, thank you for your prayers because he felt God has healed me. He still had a dissecting aortic aneurysm. He still had a catastrophic, you know, event happen to him that left him with medical bills that nobody could pay this side of glory. But he's given God all the glory and honor and praise. God has given him life again, and he said it's given me a whole new appreciation. So God sometimes has greater purposes in our not being healed the way we want to in our time. And those... I don't know why. I don't have those answers. But I I have faith enough to believe that God will always do what is best and right. I stopped trying to figure out God a long time ago. I walk by faith, not by sight. He is God. He will always do what's best and right. We just described him in in Exodus there as a God of compassion, love, mercy, forgiveness. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it has been a delay in the prayer, but he comes into the king's presence, verse 2, with sadness of face. Look at this, verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. This is unusual because apparently lots of cupbearers in Medo-Persian history lost their lives for coming into the king's presence and raining on his parade because of their personal issues. He didn't want to hear about it. He didn't care about that. So for, for Nehemiah to even come into his presence with this sad look on his face, at least the man's transparent, but it's literally taken his life into his own hands. I was very, that's why it says in verse, the end of verse 2, I was very much afraid. I thought I could hide this from the king. I'm being a little too transparent here. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it you want? I remember Jesus in the New Testament went up to a blind man one time and he said, what would you like me to do for you? You know, now you would think, The blind man would have said, duh, I can't see, Uh, you know. Okay, well, think that through. What's the greatest need in your life? I believe it is Jesus Christ in the removal of our sins. You know, physical blindness may simply be a precursor to the spiritual blindness that the man may have already been in. And yet Jesus asked that question. Now, if Jesus were to show up in your bedroom, oh, about 2 o'clock this morning, when you go home tonight and go to bed, and he showed up in your bedroom and said, what do you want me to do for you? Here's what I encourage you to do. Think it through first. Before you open your mouth, think it through. Think it through from God's perspective, not a fleshly or earthly perspective. Don't be silly enough to ask to win the lottery or something dumb like that. What do you want God to do for you? I think that, in part, is the essence of prayer. What do you want me to do for you? We pray, we seek his face, we lift up our hands and our hearts and our praise and our worship to him, and then he responds by saying, what do you want me to do for you? You want to think about that on the drive home tonight, because I promise you this, at some point in time in your life, you're going to hear God ask you that question. And you'll want to think through very carefully, very carefully how you respond. What would you have me do for you? I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know what my answer is going to be? And you can't copy mine. You cannot copy mine. 
Okay, well, don't give me yours first because I don't want to hear it. I got mine. Don't rain on my parade, okay? You know what happens to cupbearers that rain on the king's parade. Lord, I would like your perfect will perfectly fulfilled in my life for the rest of eternity. That's how I'm going to answer that question. But like I said, you can't use my response. You got to think on that for a while yourself. Why would you want more of me? Oh. <laughs> oh, come on. You were talking about me, weren't you? Yeah. You know, and I, that's a prayer I can guarantee is going to be answered. When we walk into eternity with him, man, it'll be like the ability to look into the sun for as long as you want to. In his radiance, in his glory, hearing the voices of angels singing his praises and hundreds of millions of saints gone by that are uh, there in glorious white garments. Oh, what a day that will be. You know, until we get that prayer answered, Dwayne, how about we give more of us to him? You want more of God? He wants more of you. In fact, there's a part of me that says this side of glory, you got all of God you're going to get. You got the Bible. You got Jesus Christ. You got his Holy Spirit. You got everything you need, okay, until we see him. And, I mean, it's like Moses uh, going to the mountain. You can't see God in all of his fullness in sinful fallen flesh. We'd be incinerated. Someday we will see him in all of his glory. But until then, Lord, I want more of you. Yes, 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 I do, I do, I do. And what I hear as soon as I say that is, I want more of you too. Amen. I want more of you too. Something to think about. So the king said to me, verse 4, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. You ever been put in that position before where somebody said, said something really important to you, and you've got to answer up a really quick, instant prayer, and you've got to keep it to yourself, but you've got all of about 16 nanoseconds to pull it off? You're, there's just some groan inside you that goes, oh, I need some words. I need some intelligence. I need some wisdom. I need some discernment. Lord, give me something to say. And then he answered the king. James says, everyone should be slow to speak. Long to listen, eager, eager to listen, but slow to speak. Slow to speak. So he prayed to the God of heaven before answering him. I, I, I love this passage because uh, it reminds me, this is the second of ten mentions where Nehemiah is praying. The first prayer seemed in chapter 1 to be a lot more formal as he's praying for three to four months about Jerusalem. But this is a different kind of prayer. This was the kind of prayer where Peter walks out of the boat. Jesus says, come walking to me on the water. And he's doing fine as long as he's got his eyes on Jesus. And then he sees the wind and the waves. And he goes, whoa, dude, ah! And then he starts sinking. And, and he, he's just got, ah! He's just got this second to pray before he drowns. And he goes, ah! Help me! Help me, Jesus! You ever pray that kind of prayer? I mean, just a prayer of desperation. It took no time at all. But it's not the length of your prayers that has effect with God. It's the urgency of your prayers. It's the fervency of your prayers. Any Pharisee can pray, Oh, Lord, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, yeah, that's not the essence of spiritual warfare wrapped up in that little puppy, I'll tell you. That, you know, but James does say the fervent and righteous prayers of a righteous man, it avails much. But fervent prayers, that's the kind of prayers. And that's what you see here uh, that Nehemiah is doing. It's quick, but man, is it urgent. Because one wrong word to the king, and that's the end of your career, the end of your life. So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, uh, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. It's, it, it is on his heart and has been for, for several months now. But we're not even told what this prayer is. It's an urgent prayer. So it's kind of prayers what, that we throw up in a hurry when we've been taken by surprise. And I think... Uh, that kind of prayer quickly gets to the point, doesn't it? You know, it doesn't waste a lot of time or words. His heart's beating fast. He, this, the king has just asked him, Why, what are you doing sour-faced in my presence? 
And he's, he's afraid. A couple of interesting notes. See, he's been praying for months about it. Uh, he started in Jerusalem back in praying about Jerusalem in December. It's now March. But it's not the length of your prayers that, that makes them uh, effective. Jesus talked about a, a Pharisee who had prayed long, elaborate, memorized prayers. And Jesus said, a man isn't heard for his many words. The, but the Jews felt like the longer the prayer, the better the prayer. I mean, have you ever been to a Catholic rosary? Last one I was with, somebody said, how many of those beads are they going to pray over? Every single one of them, man. You know, and is there repetition, senseless repetition? When I was a kid and forced to go to the Catholic Church, we used to blaze our way through that as fast as we could. No human being could understand what we were saying, but it went, and we were done because you had to do so many, uh, our fathers and so many Hail Marys before you could get out of the uh, confessional booth or out of the church anyway. And, And I was thinking, those are not the kind of prayers that God hears. I'm not saying that there are not some very sincere Catholics. That's not what I'm saying at all. But don't get into the habit of rote, memorized prayers that are mechanical and may not describe your situation at all. Is is God worthy of of praise? You betcha. Uh, Is his son Jesus to be magnified? Absolutely. But be careful about that. So he's made his request to the king. And I think that you and I ought to be in the habit of offering up those short, kind of heartfelt prayers, and it should be as natural as breathing. You know, you should pray 100 times a day. You know, now, don't, you don't, <laughs> you're thinking, well, how do I do that, Pastor Jim? Do I, you know, I'm driving on the way to work. You mean I can't talk to God? Because I, I can't put my hands together like this. i got to grab the steering wheel. I can't bow my head and close my eyes in prayer because that's what we always do in church. Well, you do that and you'll see Jesus a lot sooner than you imagine. But you can. You can pray with your eyes open. Did you know that? You can pray with your hands on the steering wheel. Did you know that? You can pray anytime and all the time. So don't wait for some formal reason to pray. Just make, it should be as natural as breathing, communing with your heavenly Father that, that, that loves you so much. <sighs> Instant prayers. It says, interestingly enough as well, in verse, in verse 6, then the king, uh, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? So it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Why does it mention that the queen is sitting there? The king's mother is Esther, or at least his stepmother if they weren't related by marriage. Uh, This is Artaxerxes. His father was Xerxes, who was the husband of Vashti and afterwards uh, Esther, the book of the Bible, it bears her name. So that's the same period we're looking at. Boy, there were women of strong influence uh, in the Persian court. Can I tell you, some things never change. Women have a profound effect on their husbands. They really do. I mean, there's a lot of times where Kathy, you know, gives me uh, the nudge in the ribs and goes, yo, you know, and she brings something to my attention. Tell, I, I pay attention. I pay attention. You know, uh, I know my associate pastors in the church have said, well, who's the pastor of the church? You or your wife? I said, we're one flesh, so it doesn't really matter, does it? If she asks you to do something, do you think you ought to do it or do you think you ought to get fired? You know, I mean, choice is yours. You don't have to do it. But if I ask you to water Kathy's flowers out front, do you think you should water Kathy's flowers out front? I'd do it if I were you. I mean, just saying. If any boss of mine in any workplace asks me to do something, unless he's asked me to sin, I'm going to... Do what they ask me to do. That, that just makes sense. Wives have a tremendous role. So you just think about uh, Artaxerxes' uh, stepmom or, or mother by, by birth. Now, she had a tremendous influence in the court of Xerxes and this queen uh, whose name, uh, what was her name again? Oh, Damaspia. Uh, he had at least three other concubines, but... Uh, uh, she uh, had, had influence in the court. And wouldn't it be interesting if God used her to whisper into her husband's ear, let him have whatever he wants, honey. Let Nehemiah have whatever he wants. He's been a faithful cupbearer for eons. Give him what he wants. Come on. Cut him some slack. In fact, give him a present. What do you say? 
cup beer is there a dime a dozen. You can get anybody to drink a poisoned wine. That's fine. They'll, we'll get, we get new ones on a weekly basis here, but give him what he wants. Uh, it, it appears in, in chapter 5, verse 14, that Nehemiah spent uh, two terms in governor, uh, as governor of, of Judah, uh, and the first leave of absence from the royal court was 12 years. So uh, then in verse uh, 7, so I said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates, because they hated Jews, and so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that uh, I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted me my, my request. Why was the gracious hand of God upon Nehemiah? He was a man of prayer. He was a man who sought God. You want the gracious hand of God upon you, your life, your, your, your wife, your, your husband, your children, your grandchildren? Then be the kind of person of prayer and altar building that, that Nehemiah was. So I went to the governor in verse 9 of Trans-Euphrates, gave him the king's letters, and the king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. It's a 900-mile it's a journey. And there was lots of bandits along the way. So. And when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Yeah, they should have been more afraid of God than Nehemiah. But they were very afraid of the Persian emperor who had his signet ring impressed upon all of these letters of recommendation. Uh, you know, I just am amazed at how God works on behalf of his people. When we pray, it moves the hand of God in ways that I don't fully understand. It is not that God changes his mind when I pray. The Bible's crystal clear in a half a dozen places. It says, God is not a man that he should change his mind. But when I pray, it puts my will in alignment with his and gets his work done. And I get blessed in the in-between the in time. It's a win-win situation. So read on in the rest of Nehemiah chapter 2. And we'll pick it up uh, there and finish off that chapter next week. But, man, there, there are so many lessons to be seen in this man and his circumstances, his prayer life and how God moved through circumstances and people. I just don't want to be too quick to plow through this and miss the essential lessons. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Don't wait for formal opportunities for prayer. Don't wait for Wednesday night and Sunday to, to catch up on your prayer journey. You should be praying these kind of urgent prayers all the time. All the time. And the gracious hand of God will be upon you. I want you blessed. Is that okay? God wants you blessed, whatever that might mean in your circumstance and mine. But we got to do this thing God's way. We just have to do this thing God's way. So when you pray, be sure you wrap up your prayers with something like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will be done, but thine. And you can always rest assured that God hears those kind of prayers and will respond to those kind of prayers. You know, and this pagan king... I mean, doesn't Proverbs 21 say that the king's heart is like a water course in God's hands? He guides and directs it wherever he sees fit for it to go. Say so you pray. Pray. There's a lot to pray about these days. I mean, there's saber rattling all over the globe. Putin's threatening nuclear, you know, uh, uh, warfare and accusing Ukraine of dirty bombs and stuff like that as a pretext to uh, launch a preemptive attack of his own potentially. You know, China wants Taiwan back and is willing to go to war over that. Boy, if there was a time to pray for our nation's leaders, that time would be today. That's for sure. But on a, on a more personal note, I just want you happy. I want you blessed. I want you walking in the perfection of God's will. And that's what God wants. And it's so easy. You got the book. You got the Savior. You got the Holy Spirit. Amen. You need what else? Yeah, that's made up of sinful fallen people just like you and me. We need each other, though, to be sure. Let's stand and close in prayer, shall we? You're a good God. Your love, your grace, and mercy are legendary. Your works of such a magnificent magnitude, no mind can even begin to comprehend the enormity of your, your love, your grace, your power, the infinite expanse of the heavens over our head. 
Lord, who could contemplate you or, or your heart or mind? But it humbles me to know that when your people pray, you listen and you care. You're a God of compassion and love and grace and mercy. And I pray that you'd pour it out upon us, that you would increasingly make us a people of prayer to pray not just in political season, not just when the chips are down, not just when the finances dry up or our health goes away, but a people that pray without ceasing, like Paul told the Thessalonians to do. May we be quick to pray those prayers of urgency like Nehemiah did, like Peter did when he was sinking in the, in the waves. We are your children. We look to you, our Heavenly Father, to provide for every need in the future as you have every need in the past. We are here tonight by your grace, your mercy, because you're not done with us yet. There is yet a plan, a purpose that the living God has for his children still walking the earth today. We cry out, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until that day comes, keep us faithful, prayerful, in love with you, walking in obedience to your commands, and reaching out to this lost world with the love of Jesus Christ. I thank you for people like Franklin Graham that's on Nationwide TV telling people about the love of Jesus. I thank you for Greg Loria, Calvary Chapel pastor that's getting on Nationwide TV telling people about Jesus. I'm so thankful for the voices that are able to reach masses that I cannot. And I pray that you would reach even more by the power of your Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We are yours, Lord, and commit ourselves into your hands with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good. Well, have a great rest of the week in him, and we will see you Sunday.